Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. New at 6, a Floresville police officer arrested and facing family assault charges. Corporal Marcus Olivo facing two counts of assault causing bodily injury to a family member. That's according to the Wilson County Sheriff's Office. The alleged assault happened this past Sunday morning just before 8. The questions about the arrest were referred to the Department of Public Safety, who tells our defenders that the Texas Rangers have been asked to assist with this investigation. The chief of Floresville, Floresville's police department says Olivo quote will receive administrative disciplinary action for violation of the Floresville Police Department policy and procedure end quote. The department is cooperating with the investigation. What started out as ethnic studies taught in schools is now being called critical race theory by opponents. Yeah, to try to stop it, Texas lawmakers are expected to pass legislation that would ban what they say are lessons that teach one race is superior over another. But that is not so, says a San Antonio professor who tells our Jesse Degollado it's a way of showing how the past relates to the present. About my race? As the man who helped create African American to... studies in Texas schools. We're not saying that anybody now is responsible for what has happened in the past. Okay. But he says there's much for students to learn about what did happen, including slavery. Now that we're here, okay, we know it's not going to be pretty and the conversations are not going to be comfortable. But now that we're here, let's talk about how we can move forward to a hopeful future for this nation. Now is the time to do it, he says. Protests calling for social justice have made people aware and they're ready to understand. But if laws are enacted that he says would severely limit what is taught about the correlation between the past and the present. We would teach a very watered down curriculum that skirts around very critical, crucial issues about race that we need to discuss if we want to progress as a nation. Scott says it's not about one race being superior over another. And he says data has shown students learning about the injustices of the past and other races don't widen the divisions that could lead to confrontations. They're now going to have conversations with each other and we're going to build bridges. Bridges of understanding, he calls them. Texas lawmakers are expected to pass the bill and Governor Abbott has said he'll sign it into law when he gets it. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. An 11 hour long standoff situation between San Antonio police and a man with a gun ends peacefully. It all happened just before 11 last night off Ada Street and South New Braunfels Avenue. That's east of I-37. Police received reports of a man walking around an HEB with a gun and telling a customer he was going to shoot himself. Chief William McManus says they have encountered him before and know he suffers from mental health issues. Eventually, police used what they call a sage round, a less lethal option than a bullet, to shoot the man and take him into custody. It's always a good feeling when these end, the way they do right now, without anyone getting injured. That's our main goal. The 42-year-old man scheduled to undergo a psychological evaluation. No one else injured during the incident. A positive COVID-19 test at Lavernia High School bringing in-school learning to a screeching halt. Hundreds of students sent home today after school officials learned about the positive test for a student who attended prom this past weekend. The school has been shut down and 800 students will not be allowed back on campus until May 19th. They'll continue classes through remote learning. New at six, we may be on the back end of the pandemic, but the budget effects on the city could be felt for a long time. City of San Antonio staff presented an update on the current budget, as well as a look forward to the next five years. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger gives us some of the takeaways. The heart of San Antonio's budget is its general fund, which covers everything from police to parks. But the city is worried that heart won't be pumping as strong as they need it to over the next five years. $50 million over the five year period to uh, to, to fully balance the budget. Similarly, the hotel occupancy tax, which helps fund the arts in San Antonio, is looking at some lean years ahead. The forecast doesn't project a full recovery back to 2019 levels until fiscal year 25. There was some good news in the forecast, at least in the short term. City staff think the general fund could end up with a $25 million surplus this year, which could in turn help prevent numerous cost saving measures that were planned for next year, like delayed street maintenance and employee furloughs. What today's forecast didn't include were the hundreds of millions the city is expecting to get through the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. 
the biggest portion of which, about $327 million, can be used for lost revenue. I think, first of all, fill holes. I think once we figure out how to do it, how the federal government wants us to do it, those are going to be the priority areas, the, the, hot, the hot fund, the general fund. City staff are expected to present some suggestions on how to use those new federal dollars next month. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A homeless resource hub located just northwest of downtown is providing social services, meals, hygiene kits, and hope to people living on the streets. Resources are available to the homeless community at the City Council District 1 field office for free. The city's Department of Human Services teamed up with District 1 to create this program. A local nonprofit is providing the meals, hygiene kits, and a unique type of medical care. We do a lot of sort of first aid and wound care, um, you know, providing botanical medicine support. Before this, you had to go everywhere to get anything done. And it, being homeless and without a vehicle and on a bus, it takes a while. So you can only get one or two things done a day. Yeah. Services are currently being offered on Wednesdays and Fridays. To learn more about this, visit KSAT.com. San Antonio police need a little help tracking down a couple of men they say stole another man's dog on the city's southeast side last week. Officers say the victim was walking that dog in the 2800 block of Hutchins Place when the two men approached. This was on May 4th. They reportedly pointed a gun at the man and demanded his dog. They then left with the animal. The victim was not hurt. If you have any information that can help police catch up to these two, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. Are you worried that every little tickle in your throat might be the first signs of a deadly disease? Do you always check your symptoms on the internet to get a diagnosis? Your health anxiety, a condition that used to be known as hypochondria, may in fact have worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ursula Perry reports it's been rising all year, but a local expert has ideas on ways to combat it. The coronavirus headlines can make anyone uneasy. But also concern tonight with cases now up in at least 10 percent. Health experts warn the U.S. is at risk of losing its progress against the virus. But if you have health anxiety, the grim statistics can send your worries into overdrive. With health anxiety, healthy patients fret, panic, and obsess over medical concerns. Despite your efforts at self-talk and whatever else you do, you can't get rid of it. If your symptoms interfere with your ability to think, perform everyday activities, or sleep, it's a good idea to seek medical help. Medications and therapy can help. Far and away, the best treatment for anxiety disorders are therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy or desensitization therapy. Some other tips? Steer clear of sensationalized media coverage. Instead, get your information directly from sources like the CDC or the World Health Organization. Avoid Googling your symptoms to self-diagnose. Try meditation, yoga, exercise, or some other healthy distractions to redirect that energy. Also, avoid caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. They can trigger your episodes. And go easy on yourself. Battling anxiety, especially during an extended pandemic, is particularly difficult. Some experts are saying that about 12% of the population is suffering from health anxiety right now. And unlike other disorders, it seems as though men and women both suffer from it about the same amount. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with time saver traffic right now. This intersection, it's back to becoming a uh, familiar trouble spot yeah. at this time of day. 281 and 410 West. You can see both the flyover there, the main lanes of 410 headed west, both slow going at this hour. If we have learned anything over the past couple of weeks when it comes to San Antonio in the spring, chances are we are going to see some hail. You might be familiar with that, but you may not be aware of the science behind it, why that happens. This week's new episode of KSAT Explains is all about hail. It's available to stream right now on KSAT.com. You can also watch it on the KSAT TV app, which you can download for free on any streaming device. And I am very happy to say that we do not appear to have any hail in our viewing area today, which is what? An unusual thing. For the last two days, we certainly did. Uh, yes, it's nice to have a break and a rep reprieve and see blue in our sky this afternoon. 77 degrees out there right now in the aquifer. Check this out. Up nearly half a foot today. 665 
0.6. We're only one tenth of a foot below the May average. We've made up a lot of ground lately. Pollen count though, mold high, of course, with recent rainfall at nearly 2,000 pecan on the low end. Temperatures? 70s, 78 Castroville and Pleasanton, 72 Comfort, 73 in Bandera and 72 now in Seguin. Very quiet this evening, comfortable conditions, low humidity, temperatures just gradually falling through the 60s and not as breezy. But Myra, an active pattern looks like it's on its way again. We're going to talk more about that coming up. Thanks, Adam. Republican lawmakers in the House voting to remove fellow Republican Liz Cheney from leadership in the GOP caucus. What Cheney had to say after that vote, next at six. But first around Texas from a pandemic perk to a Texas law, alcohol to go is here to stay. Governor Greg Abbott signed the bill to permanently allow Texans to include alcohol, wine, and mixed drinks in takeout orders from restaurants. Originally, the governor signed a waiver to allow to go alcohol sales last March. It was only supposed to last until May of 2020, but was then extended indefinitely. House Bill 1024 was approved by more than two thirds of the House and Senate before being signed by Governor Abbott today. Texas Alliance of Child and Family Services is weighing in on the current capacity crisis within our foster care system, what the nonprofit is seeing and what their hopes are to improving the system for the benefit of the children. Kids as young as 12 years old can now get the COVID-19 vaccine and some here in San Antonio already did. That story coming up tonight. Now to the big story out of Washington today. House Republicans making a big decision about their leadership and their strategy for the 2022 midterm elections and beyond. The party voted to remove Liz Cheney of Wyoming from their leadership ranks this morning after her pushback on former President Trump's false claims of fraud in the 2020 election. Karen Kafa looks at what's next from Washington. Minutes after House Republicans voted her out of their number three leadership spot, Congresswoman Liz Cheney outlined a new mission. We've got to get back to a position where uh, we are a party that can fight for conservative principles, that can fight for substance. We cannot be dragged backward uh, by uh, the very dangerous lies of a former president. Cheney removed from the leadership ranks after repeatedly and publicly rejecting former President Donald Trump's false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. Cheney's GOP allies shaking their heads. The truth is that the election was not stolen. 74 million voters were not disenfranchised. They were just outnumbered. And it's important for our party to take inventory of that and go out and win the next election instead of continuing the big lie. The vote coming just before a House panel convened another hearing into the January 6th Capitol insurrection led by Trump supporters. Members of Congress had to be quickly evacuated because a violent mob had breached the Capitol. Cheney's ouster signaling House Republican leaders will align with Trump in the run-up to the 2022 midterms. I'm looking forward to being speaker in the next Congress. Democrats dismayed. It appears that the big lie is no longer on the retreat among Republicans, but instead is spreading like a cancer. GOP Representative Elise Stefanik of New York has positioned herself to succeed Cheney, even receiving Trump's backing. But some of Trump's conservative supporters say Stefanik's voting record is too moderate, teeing up another potential party split. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. Take a live look outside with Sky 12 right now, 77 degrees. This is Hemisphere Park. Some of the playgrounds down there. It's a great place to hang out on a beautiful day like today. The splash pad, I believe, it's now reopened again. And it's so nice to have a payoff like today after you've seen the stretch of storms we've been dealing with, Adam. Yeah, and everything's so green and lush. Yeah. That's the nice thing as well. And we don't, instead of having the cracked dirt, we've got mud. <laughs> so enjoy it while we will can. Love. Go mud. That's right. Yeah, there you <laughs> get in the truck and go mudding if you can. Kids and yeah, and the bigger kids. Bigger kids. That's like what I was going to say. The one you see here. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Has not happened lately with this weather pattern. Hey, have fun, get dirty. <laughs> really didn't happen Friday night. <clears throat> 
A couple of Friday nights, out there. <laughs> <laughs> not just one. <laughs> okay, all right. Quiet for a few more days, and if you like mud and you'll like what we have coming on Saturday, humidity returns for the weekend as well. That's going to add to the rainfall potential. Good rain chances are ahead of us again after a few quiet days. Let's take a look at our rainfall. This is just at the airport, the official climate site here in San Antonio. Month to date, 2.31. That's about three quarters of an inch above average since January 1st. 11.34 inches of precipitation. I say precipitation, not rain, because remember, some of that moisture precipitation was in the form of snow that we got in February. So 11.34 inches, the liquid equivalent adding, obviously, to this and the departure from average. It's nice to be in the positive side. We're 1.33 inches above average for year to date. Precip. This is the rainfall over the past three days. You see some really nice sweet spots there. Uvalde County, Medina County, especially up into Kendall County, some parts of Bear County, particularly right along the aquifer recharge zone. But where we need the rain the most down south, LaSalle County in particular cashing in on over five inches estimated by the radar. That's just north of Fowlerton basically right there. And we'll take a look at the drought monitor and then put the radar on top of it coming up next half hour. Our clouds cleared on out this afternoon here in San Antonio. Along the border, we still have some clouds and even blow off cloud cover aloft from storms that are in Mexico and going to stay in Mexico this evening. The real action is far east of us right now, moving through parts of the mid Atlantic, the Carolinas and the southeast. And our next system is just a little ripple in the flow in the Pacific Northwest right now. That's going to be affecting us more in the days ahead. You look at Saturday, we bump our rain chances up to 60%. So we are expecting some fairly numerous showers, a few lighter thunderstorms anticipated into Sunday and early next week. We're looking at a fairly active pattern with daily scattered thunderstorms possible and the potential for some severe weather in there, particularly into next week. We'll be here. We'll keep an eye on it and keep you updated, but it's nice to have a little bit of a break, at least for now. 61 this morning, 76 the high temperature, which is 10 degrees below average. Now we're at 75. The breezy wind out of the north has pumped the brakes a bit. It's going to continue to do so. You're not even going to notice it really the rest of the evening. Dew points now at 58. So comfortable, pleasant out there. And really, tomorrow's going to be comfortable as well. Friday, not so bad in terms of humidity. But by this weekend, humidity is back in full force, and you're going to notice it, especially next week. I mean, we're talking the impressive level with dew points in the low 70s. And remember, that's fuel for thunderstorms. And I do anticipate that scattered activity, partially as a result of that humidity, but not only as a result of the humidity. Temps now, 80 Beeville, 78 Catula. Those are some of the warmer locations, even 78 Corpus Christi. Get to Fredericksburg at 65, 69 at Kerrville. It is comfortable, but let's talk about tomorrow morning. We'll be running a little below average. 55 in Fredericksburg, Kerrville, and Rock Springs. 64 in Del Rio and Catula. 59 here in San Antonio. And then by the afternoon, we just get well into the 70s. So often this time of year, Catula's into the 90s or even triple digits. Nah, 80 degrees tomorrow. Mixture of sun and clouds in Catula. Holotus about 73 along with Leon Springs, New Braunfels 75, Lavernia, Elmendorf 75, and Bernie 71. A pleasant day running below average. A decent amount of cloud cover, I think, to start, but otherwise just partly cloudy. So we'll call it a mixture of sun and clouds. Low humidity, northeasterly breeze at 5 to 15, so not as gusty as today. Quiet through Friday. We talked about that. Then we boost those rain and storm chances into the weekend and even next week. But as for heat, we're not looking at anything too hot anytime soon. Nothing, you know, into the 90s. We're just looking at 80s in the extended forecast. And that is just fine. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Adam. Thanks, Adam. All right. Spurs in the Big Apple. And I, I'm curious, Larry, does Jakob Pertl have a nickname? You're probably going to give him one. No, I just was curious <laughs> if he had one yet because I didn't want to give him one if he had one. Give him one. Block him. Block him. <laughs> Block him, Pirtle. There it you go. Actually, can you work that in actually some works. Yeah, can yeah. you work in something with assists? Pirtle and assists, I don't know. I'll, I'll work on it okay. while you're doing your <laughs> yes. sportscast here. <laughs> Spurs are at the Nets tonight, and you know what? Jakob Pirtle is turning into quite the assist man for the Spurs, and the city of Converse honored Bryce Wisdom today. Coming up.
after thrashing the Milwaukee Bucks by 21 points Monday night at home. The Spurs will play at the Brooklyn Nets tonight with a chance to clinch a play-in spot. Their magic number is one. So win by the Spurs or a loss by the Pelicans tonight who play at the Mavs and the Spurs are in. Now they'd rather win, of course, and handle business by themselves. Monday night, Yaka Pirtle handed out a career-high eight assists, second to DeJounte's nine helpers. Now, Yaka is averaging a career-best two assists per game this season. When I started playing basketball, I always tried to just like look for the best possible shot. Um, and a lot of times um, that is, yeah, consists of me like trying to look for a shooter somewhere else or like hand it back to my point guard or something for a float or whatever it is. So I, I think that that just all came together against, against Milwaukee. And that's what was the Spurs Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys will get the first crack at the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the 2021 NFL kickoff game Thursday night, September 9th at Raymond James Stadium. Bucks quarterback Tom Brady and Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott will face off for just the second time in their careers. And the national stage will also offer a heck of a first test for new defensive coordinator Dan Quinn and a Dallas defense that has been revamped in the last few months. The Bucks opened as six-point favorites. In the AFC South, the Houston Texans will host the Jacksonville Jaguars in week one on September Sunday, September 12th at noon at NRG Stadium. The game will serve as the debuts of Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback Trevor Lawrence, the overall number one pick. Jag head coach Urban Meyer and Texans head coach David Coley. Jacksonville is an early one and a half point favorite. Oh, okay. You just sent over the Broncos 2021 schedule? Okay. I'll pull it up right now. All right. I beat them. Beat them. Destroyed them. Beat them. Beat them. Yeah, this looks great. I'm going to go print it right now. Thanks. That's former Denver Broncos quarterback Peyton Manning getting Denver fans pumped up for the new season with his signature wit. Rookie safety Caden Stearns and the Broncos will open the season at the New York Giants. Rookie quarterback Kellen Mon and the Vikings will start the 2021 campaign on the road at the Cincinnati Bengals. And rookie safety Trayvon Merrick and the Las Vegas Raiders will host the Ravens on Monday Night Football. You know, it was a special day for the Wisdom family because the city of Converse has a new street, Bryce Wisdom Way, to honor the brave teenager who lost his life to cancer. Bryce Wisdom Way is now the street between DW Rutledge Stadium and the baseball and softball fields at Judson High School. His family, friends, and city leaders were all on hand. It's just so rewarding and so, so amazing. It's a blessing to know that now he will be remembered forever and his legacy will always be continuous and everybody will always know his story. It's a blessing for the family. It's a blessing for the community, the school. You know, um, I actually still work out here at Judson, so it's actually going to help me a lot. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad to see it. You know, he's a legend. He lives forever. He's an angel. And, and I love that he's on it. Mama Wisdom also said that the mayor of Converse recently declared May 1st as Bryce Strong Day. Guys, what a great yeah. gesture. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAP Q&A is up next. So many of us have been affected by cancer. Someone we know, someone we love, who maybe has passed away or maybe survived. And if you know somebody who has survived, they may actually get to take part in a new study that they're putting together at the University of Texas Health uh, San Antonio. And we are joined by Dr. Amelie Ramirez right now, who is going to take part in this study. Doctor, thank you for joining us. And you're particularly looking at Latinos when it comes to surviving cancer. Tell me why. That's correct, Steve. We have over 15 million cancer survivors, but we don't have an accurate number of how many of them are Latino cancer survivors. And uh, there's a number of things that impact our, our Latino communities, such as discrimination, chronic stress, uh, fatigue, other kinds of things that impact them. Some of the genetic ancestry that we have that were different. We represent anywhere from kind of Afro-Caribbean to European descent. And all of these things impact uh, cancer. So there is a difference culturally when it comes to cancer survivorship. That's something a lot of people don't think about. You just think about, you know, the physical impact uh, of the disease. Have you seen any examples of that in patients here in San Antonio, how the fact that they are Latino may affect uh, how they're surviving their road after cancer? 
Yes, we've done different studies with, for example, breast cancer survivors, and we're, what we're finding is there there's a, a, a deep um, depression in some of our patients uh, because it, you know they're saying to myself, "Am I going to look different? When am I going to be able to come back to work?" So we see what we call several health-related quality of life issues that impact our patients. We see a lot of fatigue, um, you know, and uh, just you know concerns about the body image. So all of these things impact our cancer survivors. Now, this is a study that hasn't happened yet. I want to point that out. And that if if somebody is a cancer survivor or knows somebody who's a cancer survivor, there are specific cancers that you're looking for. And can somebody express interest to UT Health San Antonio right now if they want to take part? Uh, definitely. We, we are going to be looking for over 3,000 Latino cancer survivors, and we're working cooperatively with the Sylvester uh, Cancer Center in Miami. My colleague Frank Benedo and I uh, were awarded this grant from the National Cancer Institute, and we are the first study to look at a cohort of Latinos. So we are uh, recruiting over 3,000. All cancers will be eligible. Um, and, um, you know, so and right now we'll be starting active recruitment in August. But if somebody would like to call and place their name on, uh, they can call our office at 210-562-6505. Uh, and um, so we're looking for all kinds of breast, cervical, ca um, prostate cancer, colon cancer, stomach, liver, um, and the only criteria is being two years out, you know, that if you've had cancer within the last two years and are not currently under active treatment at the moment. Yeah, and we put that number up on the screen. That's the number. If you want to express interest, again, they're not actively recruiting until August, but you can call that number if you're interested in taking part in this study on Latino cancer survivorship. 210-562-6505. Uh, let's just leave that number up on the screen if somebody's interested. And Dr. Ramirez, uh, can you explain to us once this study is done, what's the benefit of having this information? How exactly will that be used? Well, this information will help us design future studies to uh, address some of these common issues that we're seeing in our patients and how to help both the, the survivor and the family deal with some of the after effects of cancer. So we are, are really looking forward to gathering that data. Right now, there's a, a gap of information that we don't know the knowledge and, and exactly how our patients are responding. Uh, so we'd like to improve that so that we can help them in the future. We also want to give them uh, hopefully reduce recurrences in the future. So by following, we'll be tracking these individuals over a six year period of time uh, so that, that we can inform how we can better assist them um, throughout the study. And I feel like this study sort of speaks to the fact that surviving the disease itself is just one part of this very long journey for so many people. There are effects long after someone has been told they are in remission, long after they have uh, stopped undergoing active treatment. Is, is that an accurate assessment? That's so true, Myra. What, what we're seeing, you know, there could be, you know, uh, issues, sexual intimacy issues, fertility issues, weight loss, weight gain issues, uh, you know, difficult, um, mem some memory issues that might be going on, you know, and just having fatigue and, and anxiety that go along with this. So again, we, we hope that we can better um, help them, uh, at least prepare them for perhaps some of the treatments that they might be going through and uh, help them over time to overcome that. Why San Antonio and Miami? Because they seem like they're very different Latino communities uh, in, the, in their makeup and, and just, you know, even culturally, some of the things uh, that, that happen in both of those communities. Right. Well, right now, Latinos represent over 18 percent of the U.S. population. We are now the majority minority population in the United States. And uh, in South Texas, we represent predominantly a Mexican-American population. About 69 percent of our population is Hispanic or Mexican-American. And in the Miami area, we'll be able to get a little bit more uh, Cuban, uh, Puerto Rican, Central and South American uh, population. And so we, again, um, because of ancestry, we want to look at these different ethnicities within the Latino population. It is a fascinating, it is a fascinating study. Again, uh, they'll start recruiting people in August. If you're interested, call the number 210-562-6505. Dr. Ramirez, please keep us posted on exactly what's happening with this study and, and when the report is done and, and what your findings are. 
Thank you. We certainly will because we'll need a, a, over 1,500 just from our area uh, to participate in this study. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amelie Ramirez. We'll be right back. The News Around America KFC isn't just working on the next chicken recipe. The chain is showing off new packaging that will debut this summer, calling it a more modern take on its classic red and white colors. Colonel Sanders will still be on the buckets, sandwich wrappers and cups, but the new designs will be more like the original signature bucket. The packaging also going to be slightly more environmentally friendly. Officials say they worked with Sustainable Forestry Initiative and Forest Stewardship Councils to develop approved recyclable paperboard. Meantime, Uncle Ben's revamped packaging is now out. Mars Food says Ben's original can now be found at stores across the country. Last year, the company announced it was overhauling the name and image because it was rooted in racial stereotypes. The new packaging keeps the same original color of blue, orange and blue, but it gets rid of the image of Uncle Ben, a possibly fictitious black rice farmer. Some Uncle Ben's products will remain on store shelves until they sell out. So, you know, tomorrow is traditionally Thermometer Thursday. Uh-huh. I'm thinking maybe we should start, you know, Rain Gauge Thursday or something <laughs> with all the rain we've been getting lately. I know, right? It wouldn't be hard to make a rain gauge at home and, and calibrate it properly. You would just need an already calibrated rain gauge, and you could do this just with a mason jar. You could do it. Just fill up a real calibrated rain gauge to one inch, dump it in, mark that line, two inches. But you got to calibrate. Got to calibrate. I'm, sensing, I'm sensing some interest in Rain Gauge <laughs> Thursday. T too easy. <laughs> oh, too easy, he says. You can't just use any device and then measure the liquid in. It has to be calibrated to an 8-inch standard Rain Gauge. Calibrated? So, yeah. It's got to be, wait, does it have to be calibrated? <laughs> okay, we're going to get in trouble. The producer's telling us to move this thing. We're on. in time jail. <laughs> All right, Billy T, I'm moving. 75 right now. We'll be in the 60s this evening. Nothing to worry about. A couple of days will be very quiet, pleasant, but stormy pattern looks like it'll be back. We'll talk about it coming up. Well, she didn't quite make it to 20 years, but Ellen DeGeneres says that she is ending her daytime talk show. She told The Hollywood Reporter she's planning to wrap it all up next year, which would be 19 years on the air. Ellen says she no longer feels challenged. But the beginning of the end may have started more than a year ago when reports started surfacing, accusing DeGeneres of being controlling and difficult to work with. Dozens of former staffers accused the show's top producers of sexual misconduct. DeGeneres plans to discuss her decision during an interview with Oprah Winfrey set to air on the Ellen DeGeneres show this week. Bad news for Chick-fil-A fans who have enjoyed being showered with sauces with their orders. The chicken chain dealing with a sauce shortage, and it's not just the beloved Chick-fil-A sauce. Yeah, what that means, at least for a little while, is that customers will not be getting a handful of their favorite sauces with their order. Just one sauce cup per item. So go easy. Chick-fil-A says it's having supply issues, but it's working to fix the problem as quickly as possible. Now I'm having issues. <laughs> <laughs> not every car part has its own day, at least not yet, as far as we know. But the odometer is the part that does. Today is National Odometer Day. Okay, right, I'm going to side with Caskey. On the, I know what Caskey's going to say. Okay, right. so this is the thing that measures how many miles your car is traveling. <sighs> Versions of the odometer have been around since the 1600s. They're developed for horse-drawn wagons. I had no, <laughs> no idea way. on that. I did not the know first that car odometer made its appearance in 1903, and like everything else, odometers are pretty high-tech now. Besides overall distance, your car's gone. You could use it for trips. Your car's computer will let you know how long it's been since your last oil change. I have no idea <laughs> why there's a national odometer day because, I mean, it, is there like an odometer industry that's really hoping you'll buy an odometer? Yeah, so I'm like, what is... It is kind of funny, though, that before this show, you and I were talking, Kasky, about yeah. how you look for car parts all the time all to fix the up your old truck. <laughs> Have you ever bought <laughs> an odometer? New. No, that's okay. something I've never had to touch, but I am going to get a new idle air intake uh, control valve ah, yes. for Old Blue. I don't know. I don't think that has its own day. It should. I'm just <laughs> guessing it doesn't. Should. Yeah. yeah old Blue. Myra, Myra said it's not that old. 
it's got a cassette deck in it. And then I said, okay, yes it is. Time flies. <laughs> Once you do the math on the year, you realize, oh yeah, it, it is rather old. If it was really old school, it'd have the A-track. That's all True. I'm saying. I wonder how many of those are still on the road. I bet there's some out there. Probably a few. Yeah. Yeah. So rain chances. Nothing the next couple of days. So through Friday, we're dry. We get into Saturday. We boost those chances up to 60%. So scattered to widespread in nature. Mainly rain. We're expecting Saturday a few rumbles of thunder, but it doesn't look likely that we would have severe weather at that point. Sunday and into next week, I think our odds start to just gradually rise for the potential of severe storms. So enjoy a few more quiet days before we get some more beneficial rain but some that could come at a bit of a cost. Here's the drought monitor. And again, this is updated every Thursday, so we'll have a new one come tomorrow. And I'm excited for it. I'm actually excited for next week's as well, because we'll have even bigger improvements. But here's a look at the drought monitor. The red area is indicating where we have the most extreme and exceptional drought south of San Antonio, especially down I-35. And then I put the radar from yesterday on top of it. Oh, look at that. Just the rain hitting the sweet spots where we really, really need it. I mentioned earlier in the newscast, Northern LaSalle County radar estimates of five inches. It's right there, right there near the A in Catula. Yes, it's good to see that. And elsewhere, of course, along the coastal plain and other locations and right over the aquifer recharge zone. We got some good rainfall. We love to get the rain right in this purple area here in Northern Bear County. But the red area is nice as well. The drainage zone contributing zone and you put the radar from yesterday on it and watch as time goes by one little hit and then boom another swath of good rainfall. So it's good to see that the aquifer is up nearly half a foot today and I'd anticipate it to be up a little bit more again tomorrow. It should keep responding to the recent rainfall and then get another boost in the days ahead. Don't you love good news? It's good to have that kind of positive news. It's great. Visible satellite imagery shows the early clouds this morning giving way to some afternoon sunshine. That's locally, but you head west and you still have more cloud cover. And as I mentioned, the rain chances spike again by Saturday. So we had the low clouds and we'll have some clouds coming and going the next couple of days, but we're not expecting rain through Friday. 61 this morning, four degrees below average, 76 this afternoon, 10 degrees below average, the record being 101. Now we're sitting pretty 75, good for Baseball, soccer games, whatever you have outdoors, 58 degree dew point, northerly wind at 12, which is finally pumping the brakes. But dew points are down currently, so it's comfortable outside. It's that time of year we don't see these breaks in the humidity last all that long. It's only going to last a couple more days through Friday. And then this weekend, humidity surges back in place, and it's especially oppressive into next week. And remember, that humidity adds fuel to thunderstorms. Temperatures now 77 Pleasanton down to 69 in Kerrville already 63 in Fredericksburg tomorrow morning. We'll start the day at 62 in Pleasanton 59 Canyon Lake 59 Hondo by the afternoon. We make it well into the 70s, so a very comfortable day, maybe low 80s south of San Antonio down I 35, but you look locally around Bear County Timberwood Park about 73 Elmendorf 75 hello to 73 in Lake Hills about 75. Mixture of sunny clouds tomorrow, low humidity, northeasterly breeze at only 5 to 15, and then pretty much the same as we get into Friday, just a few degrees warmer in the low 80s. Then we have those enhanced rain chances, especially Saturday, but then more activity scattered in nature thereafter into next week. We are in an active pattern. Oh, yeah. and we need it this time of year because once we get in summertime, we know what happens. Mm. Yep. All right. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning, it's Wednesday, May 12th. First at five, hundreds of students at Lavernia High School sent home today after a student who attended prom this weekend tested positive for COVID-19. According to school officials, the school's been shut down and students will not be allowed back on campus until May 19th. Stu uh, here's a look at the line of vehicles with the kids ready to get their first shots. The approval is for the Pfizer vaccine, the same dose that adults get. And behind an hours long standoff on the southeast side undergoing a mental health evaluation. The standoff started around 11 last night after someone reported a man with a gun walking in an HEB park parking lot threatening to shoot himself. He ended up leaving and San Antonio police found him on Ada Street in South New Braunfels. After about 11 hours and offering cigarettes and food, officers used a rubber bullet 
to take the man into custody. Police Chief William McManus says this isn't the first encounter with this individual. And in cases like this, ending a standoff peacefully without any injuries is their main goal. We're now working to learn the name of a woman who was hit and killed last night. San Antonio police say the driver of a pickup truck didn't see the woman before he hit her. She was taken to the hospital where she later died. We're told the driver did stop to help and will not face any charges. If you've been getting cocktails to go over the last year, the measure which allows you to do it is now permanent. Governor Greg Abbott signed into law today. Alcohol to go sales were first put into place at the start of the pandemic when bars and restaurants were ordered to shut down. Texas is the 10th state to make COVID era cocktail to go sales permanent. <laughs>